We welcome you out to our funeral services today for Brother Don Gay Van Dyke. Uh, presiding today is President Shane Bryan, and I'm Bishop David Chapel, and I'll be conducting. We appreciate all of your attendance here to celebrate Gay's life, and are grateful to have your attendance. Uh, the invocation will be given by Gaylene Greenwood, a daughter, and then we'll have a congregational hymn, Where Can I Turn for Peace, page number 129, and it'll be accompanied by Lori Chapel, and the chorister will be Sister Linda Chapel. After that song, we'll have uh, Dad's Early Life, given by Susan Kent, a daughter, and then we'll have a children's tribute to Dad by Lynn and Aaron Van Dyke, both sons. Following their tribute, we'll have a musical selection by Stephanie Hendrickson, a granddaughter, Love at Home. And following that song, we'll have a grandkids tribute given by Melissa Troxell and Brendan Van Dyke. Following their tribute, we'll have a musical number by Jaden and Melanie Van Dyke, grandchildren, families can be together forever, and I believe other grandchildren will participate as well, possibly. Uh, we'll have a speaker after that, Brother Ruland Van Dyke, his son, and then we'll go to my remarks uh, at the air, there on the, on the program. So we'll go to that, Sister Gaylene. Our dear kind Heavenly Father, we are so very grateful to be here on this day to celebrate a wonderful husband father, grandfather, and friend. We ask thee to please bless us with thy spirit during this meeting and as we adjust to life without him near us, we're very grateful for the knowledge that we can be together as families forever. And these things we say in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
John Gay Van Dyke was born January 24, 1938, to Delmer and Romania Van Dyke. He was their third son and is one of seven children. He grew up in Lyman and lived most of his life in the same home his family built when he was around six years old. Growing up, he enjoyed spending time with his dad and brothers logging, hunting, and farming together. They didn't have much in the way of worldly possessions, but they did appreciate the things that they did have. Recently, uh, when I was visiting him a few weeks ago, he mentioned how his father had, would give him a silver dollar on the 4th of July, and what a treat that was for him to be able to go and spend it. And another fun thing that they had, they would haul coal to the Lowell and Bicknell theaters, and the Lowell theater would trade them tickets, and so they could go to the movies. Um, his favorite movie was Smokey. It had Burl Ives singing in it, and a horse that he just loved that horse. Burl Ives was his favorite singer. He has shared many stories of time spent with his brothers and cousins, Leon, Carl, and Newell. When they got together and shared memories of growing up, they would all laugh, and generally they were laughing till tears were coming out of their eyes. And I loved listening to the things that they did. I enjoyed doing. Gay graduated from Wayne High School in 1957. And and after graduating, he worked in American Fork, where he went on a blind date with a cute young girl from Pleasant Grove named Mary Ellen Hewish. She loved his beautiful eyes, especially his little wink. And on their third date to the State Fair, they drove past the Salt Lake Temple and knew they were meant to be together forever. They were married in the Salt Lake Temple, August 29, 1958. Last year, they celebrated their 62nd wedding anniversary. To their union came 10 beautiful children, and they dearly loved them all. Susan, Rulin, Legrand, Joyce, Lynn, Gaylene, Bruce, Aaron, and Tanya. Leading by example, he taught them to be hardworking, resourceful, kind, always giving, and respectful to others. Mom said it didn't matter that they were poor. They enjoyed being together and working together made them rich. The family enjoyed exploring new places, seeing the beauties of nature, and building memories. After marrying, Gay and Mary Ellen lived in Lyman, briefly in Hanksville for a little bit, and in the Salt Lake area for a few years. After his father's death in 1965, They returned to Lyman to raise their family and care for the family farm, raising potatoes, grains, alfalfa, and sheep. One of Alden's favorite special memories of Dad was not long after their father passed away, and he, Dad, and Merrill went fishing up at Neff's. They caught a lot of fish. All of them, all of them were big ones. Everyone. And they just enjoyed their time together. They also had some fun experiences hunting, hunting deer together. In 1967, Gay got a job assisting the high school shop teacher, then took a position cleaning and caring for the high school. Later, he became the maintenance supervisor for Wayne School District. After working and serving the community for 35 years, he retired from the school district in 2002. While he was at the school district, there were many who had an opportunity to work with him and enjoy his fun sense of humor. Many of us children had opportunities to, to work there and work with him. and He expected a lot of us, but he was a great boss. Gay is known for his hardworking hands and talented mechanical mind. He was a genius who could fix almost anything. He liked fixing radios, TVs, and even build his own TV. There were always cars and farm equipment needing repair. He could be found creating in his carpentry or rock shop. And both the carpentry and rock shop has blessed us all. He enjoyed hunting 
and shooting with his father, brothers, sons, grandsons. He loved guns and had a nice collection. He also had a nice collection of watches. Gay was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and had various callings. Attending the temple, attending the temple helped the eternal love and respect our parents had for each other's grow stronger. Having a forever family was important to him. Gay was a humble, gentle giant with a tremendous love for each member of his family. His sister Beverly mentioned and he was like a father to her. And what a great example he and Mary Ellen were to her. And she appreciated Dad's kind and loving nature. Later on in life, as his grandchildren were not around as much, and children, and it, he developed an endearing bond with three yellow kittens Alden gave him, and a little black one that showed up on the doorstep one Halloween about the same time. Since then, he has had several cats and had a great love for the kitties. They were dear to him and provided comfort and love in his later years. His current cat, Missy, has been by his side. I could always be found curled up on his laps or curled up beside him in bed. She's been a bit lost. Over the years, there are family memories of logging, hauling animals, crops, rocks, and getting ice cream in their father's 1960 Ford F600 big red farm truck. Gay promised his father he would take good care of his dad's prized truck before his dad passed away. Recently, his son Bruce and other family members restored the truck. And we just want to thank I have special thanks to Rulin and Dean Chapel, who were instrumental in this project as well. It was a memorable moment for all when it was presented to him a few weeks ago on Easter. With many of us around, we were blessed as he was able to come out and spend a couple of hours and share stories and experiences he had on the truck. Dad has been ill for several years and our mother has taken excellent care of him. This, I believe, has blessed us so we could enjoy and learn from him a few extra months. Mom says serving him has been a pleasure and yet so hard to see him suffer. They worked at it together. She has a great, happy, joyful peace for, for him and knows he's in a better place. She knows their marriage is eternal because of the great love God has for each of us and his plan for families to be together forever. She hopes you all feel the love they have for you and the love that Grandpa had for you and Father and whatever individually, all the love that he had for you individually. Gay passed to the other side of the veil at the age of 83 on May 10th, 2021 at his home in his bed next to his loving wife. Gay is survived by his wife, Mary Ellen, Children Susan and Alan Kent, Rulin and Becky Van Dyke, Legrand and Sally Van Dyke, Joyce Van Dyke, Lynn and Annette Van Dyke, Gaylene and Mark Greenwood, Bruce and Jenny Van Dyke, Erin and Tammy Van Dyke, Tanya and Joshua Lewis, 35 grandchildren, 31 great grandchildren, and one great grandchild, great great grandchild. Total posterity with spouses, spouses, sorry, that sound right. Total posterity with spouses is 98, with one on the way in July. He is also survived by a brother, Alden and Montez Van Dyke, and a sister, Beverly and Lloyd Beekner, and several dear nieces and nephews. He was preceded in death by his parents, brothers Blake, Merrill, and Larry Van Dyke, his sister, Faye Cannon, stillborn son Daniel Van Dyke, granddaughter Karina Van Dyke, and great-grandson Liam Van Dyke. Many special thanks go to the hospice team and Dr. Chapel, who helped us care for Dad these last few months. We love you and appreciate all you did. Burial will be in the Lyman Cemetery under the care of the Springer Turner Funeral Homes of Richfield in Salina, Utah.
God's garden. God looked around his garden, and he found an empty place. He then looked down upon this earth and saw your tired face. He put his arms around you and lifted you to rest. God's garden must be beautiful. He always takes the best. He knew that you were suffering. He knew that you were in pain. He knew that you would never get well on earth again. He saw that the road was getting rough and the hills were hard to climb. So he closed your weary eyelids and whispered, Peace be thine. It broke our hearts to lose you. But you didn't go alone. <clears throat> For part of us went with you the day God called you home. Uh, Joyce found us that poem. It's an excellent poem, and uh, she's right to part of that. Uh, each of us did uh, was taken with Dad. <clears throat> Dad had his own little garden right here. Four daughters and five sons, and he and Mom were growing. That he and Mom were growing to be a premium crop. The loss of an additional stillborn child in the middle of these nine separated the garden into an older and a younger crop. I'll uh, share thoughts from the older group. Dad had a way about him. Somehow he instilled in us a desire to just be with him. <clears throat> I don't recall him ever really asking for our help. Never a lot of words and never a threat. <clears throat> He'd just come and say something like, uh, we have snow to shovel, and uh, we'd climb out of bed, and we'd go shovel walks at the school early in the morning before school started. Often, the things we did were not things we would have ever chosen to do, or really thought was much fun either. But we were with Dad, and that made it all right. It must have been some magical fertilizer he used or something on that garden because I don't recall any of us hesitating or really complaining much either. As Susan recalls the beginning of her career as an analyst at a very young age when left alone in the cold to feed the animals, the buckets of grain were filled too heavy to carry and was told to figure it out and did not come back home until she had finished the chore. In tears and, without, and with cold hands figured out that she could scoop grain from one bucket to the other to lighten the load, not wanting to disappoint or give into the tears, and being patient taught her something valuable used throughout her life. There's a solution to every problem, and we just need to look for it and not give up and figure it out. Ruin, upon returning from his mission only days before the deer hunt, with no desire to hunt down and kill any, kill one of God's fine creations, and letting Dad know he wasn't planning on hunting. He was simply handed some money and was told to go buy a winter coat and boots. That's all it took. He was out getting prepped for the hunt. probably never told Dad that he was just going to share the joy of being with him and had no intention of pulling the trigger. Uh, for Legrand, the days of getting out of school to tromp wool and dock the lambs carried on for years as he would involve his own family of boys in the process. Dad never asked for help, and his boys never knew the everyday life on the farm he and his boys were there to help get the job done. Now those boys are all grown up with children of their own, still always ready to help. The men they've become were helped along by Grandpa, learning more those days being out of school than being in. The results of Grandpa's gardening skills are clearly evident and will always be appreciated. When Legrand and I were teenagers, Dad took the family out logging to cut and cut our own trees to build a shop. Then Dad bought a bunch of woodworking tools. 
Never said he bought them for us. I never saw him use them a lot. And I'm betting that uh, after he saw Legrand's interest in woodworking that, um, at school, that he knew it would be great for all of his boys. It surely was a great investment in the life of all of us boys, and I think not intended for his own. It provided us the ability to successfully own our own businesses and helped us gain that same confidence he had. Dad had skills and confidence in just about everything. Rarely asked for outside help. Some may wonder about his closeness to God and the gospel. At that time, he showed up <laughs> on the mountain to save his kids from being stuck in the snow. Convinced me that he had a pretty good connection. The stories could go on forever, and the togetherness and the work and the family trips. He truly provided us with great life growing up and gave us everything we needed for our own success. Dad, thanks. We will always love you. Probably well, we guess that I'm going to share some thoughts and memories from us younger kids. And uh, well, Lynn did pretty good. We'll see how it goes. I'm not sure if I'll do as well as he did. Um, our dad never wore his feelings on the outside for us to see. But he never had to talk a lot to be heard. I'm sure he kept things to himself, but he never fooled us, not even once. Man, we hardly ever talked about feelings, but we always knew how much he cared. We knew it in a million ways, by a million and one little things he did. We've always known that beneath that tough exterior, he was the most special, loving, and caring father in the world. You showed us many things by taking us many places, but some of the most special places were right here at home. Some of our fondest memories were our most simplest ones. Our dad had a musical ability that always made us laugh. However, he was probably never going to get a record deal. He taught us how to make whistling sounds from glass soda bottles and how to use straws and soda cups to make music. And I'm using that term music really loosely. Many times he would break out in a silly song that was entirely original material. He's the only one that I've ever heard use the words in the song, peeing by a tree. There were lots of great memories and time spent on the farm. He taught us many things on the farm, not only about work, but about life. And especially with Bruce, Dad's diverse talents and a love for the farm was passed on to him much more than the rest of us. One time I got the opportunity to wait out a lightning storm with our dad in the cab of a pickup truck before we could change the pipe at the lower field. We got to witness one of nature's most beautiful spectacles together and enjoy the beautiful smell after it was over. It was wonderful. Some jobs such as, some jobs, such as hauling rocks were not as fun but I'm glad I got the opportunity to haul those rocks with you. I don't really like, I didn't really like it at the time, but my heart is full when I think about it. And sometimes I even miss how the dirt tastes. I'll miss those times when we used to hunt together. And I would look down the hill and see you so busy eating pine, nut, pine nuts that you missed the deer running past. It seems like you always brought rocks home when we were out with Dad. There were times when you would see Dad wandering off by himself, and then he'd come back with, and have all his pockets full of rocks, large and small. Of course, he had a bunch in his hands. Our dad loved Western movies and probably seen all Westerns pre-1970 more than five times each. We enjoyed spending many evenings watching Western movies with him. We really didn't need to say anything together to create a connection. It was definitely worth it. We had a lot, great, a lot of great memories in the Jeep. Uh, you told us where to hold on just in case we had a crisis. You told us, you took us fishing in nests and it was amazing that we got all the camping to, gear to fit in there with, with us. It was never a smooth ride, but it sure was fun. One time, me and Tanya begged you to let us ride in the Jeep as it was hitched to, 
to the truck as you pulled it off Boulder Mountain. You let us do it, and you probably knew we'd never ask again. It was like trying to survive a dust storm with no safety equipment. <laughs> Needless to say, we never asked again. Our dad was a great mentor and teacher. He allowed us to make mistakes and didn't hover over us critiquing everything we did. But there was always a mutual understanding. We knew when we screwed up. He never devalued us as individuals. When we made a mistake, he just knew it was part of the learning process. He taught us the value of hard work, teamwork, being resourceful, humor, endurance, and to always be curious about the world around us. Um, I just want to share a quick little story. The, the day that I found out Dad passed away, near our house, I take our dogs on a walk every day, and there's a special group of cottonwood trees that I'm able to sit in and contemplate. I've even talked to our Heavenly Father when life gets a little tough. It just so happened that day when my mother called and I was walking through that group of trees. I've always considered that little group of trees my sacred growth. But then it got me thinking. I was like, uh, growing up here in Lyman, I've always had wanted a place. Where's my special place? And there never was one. Couldn't think of it one certain place. And then a few words came to my mind, and it said, it was all around you. And a big part of that has to do with my dad. You old dingleberry, we're going to miss you. Thank you for all the laughs. We made a lot of memories together. Thanks, Dad, for being part of your something beautiful. We love you, Dad.
Oh, good. They have tissues up here. <laughs> I was kind of worrying. Well, I'm already using them. He, um, he sure is loved. Just seeing all you guys. And it is, um, very well deserved. <sighs> gather myself um, after I receive news um, that grandpa passed. I started rambling through boxes of old pictures. And every picture that I was able to find of grandpa he had a grandchild in his arms. I mean, I honestly did not stumble upon one picture where his proud arms were not embracing a child with all his love and warmth. Sometimes he had a child in each arm. Sometimes he had three, four, or even more in his arms, on his lap, back, jumping on his belly, and swarmed all around him. There was no doubt about it, and anyone who knows him knows that he loved and adored his grandkids. For us older grandkids, we remember his loving, his fun, loving nature. He would take us on, he would take us to shoot his guns and love to talk about them while sharing some laughs and the pride he had to experience something he loved with his grandkids. He showed us what hard work is by example, how to work on a farm, managing animals and land, and always staying busy with several other projects. Most of us can share some of our favorite memories of feeding the lambs with him and holding on and holding tightly onto old rusty cans screwed onto his tractors laughing as we enjoyed adventuring on tractor rides with Grandpa. He also loved to take us on adventures in his old Jeep Wrangler, his cars, his van, trucks, dirt bikes, four-wheelers, etc. And we all remember gathering around him and listening to his stories and sharing laughter by his side. Over the years, Grandpa couldn't do as much as he would have wanted with the younger grandkids, great-grandkids, and even great-great-grandkids. But one thing he never lost was always showing us his love, his excitement, his pride, and his humor. Although he had a great sense of humor and sometimes may have been a little bit stubborn, he was always loving and accepting of everyone. He instantly welcomed many kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, and a great-great-grandkid into our family with open arms. Everyone was family. And um, even if you weren't blood, he welcomed you instantly. Me, it's kind to heart. Warm spirit, always live on in our memories. His physical pre presence may not be here with us anymore, and a part of that will feel empty to us. But his memories, his love, his humor and fun spirit, his laugh, his jokes, and his Playful name calling, for example, stinky turkeys. His arms full of pride wrapped around us. His overwhelmingly love for guns. His hard work and, of course, his unforgettable stubbornness will always live on. That is why we are here today. It is to celebrate his life, his love, and spirit. To celebrate the memories we can all relate to with him and to celebrate our special and our personal memories that we will all keep forever locked inside our hearts. Grandpa, I 
I personally will always remember whenever I would first come over, people would say, Grandpa, let's us here. I'm going to hurry and get up. And when I would first walk into his sight, he would instantly become alert. His eyes get big, gleaming with joy, and filling, filling your pride to see your girl. I love you, Grandpa. <clears throat> A little nervous. <laughs> Grandpa, you, you taught us grandkids so much. We loved your hardworking soul and the love you had for all of us. We have so many memories with you. Grandpa, you always had work for us to do around the farm and didn't hes hesitate to get us involved. We could always put on your oversized boots and help you out with the sprinklers. We could always help you out with sheep, feeding them, herding them around, and we always loved feeding them with bottles. Loved when you'd go in the corral and we'd get in there and start wrestling them down so you could get them docked and just good times. Some of us got our first paying jobs at Grandpa's house, catching gophers and he'd pay us a dollar for every gopher we got. He had a little roll and he would pull out a dollar for every one we got and he loved us so much for Helping out on his little farm, getting them little parasites out of there. You could always find Grandpa working out in the garage. And he was always willing to let us be there and teach us something. I always felt more connected with Grandpa because I have a love of working on cars and four wheelers. He taught me so much. He valued work and always wanted to share it with us. But it wasn't always work at Grandpa's house. He loved joking around and giving us fun nicknames like McKay's or Bazer for McKay. <laughs> um, we all have memories of driving in an old tractor or the van or somewhere cool Grandpa would take us. We always loved being in all of his vehicles and we all have he was always willing to take us for a little ride, just to put a little smile on our face or just take his vehicles for a little test drive. He loved them all so much and that's why we have so many memories with them. I have a lot of memories with the van taking it to Bryce Canyon and we were cleaning out the van yesterday and found a paper with a couple of the grandkids' names on it we scribbled on. Is on the ride to Bryce Canyon. Don't get me started on his guns. He, he enjoyed shooting guns and going hunting and target practicing. He always loved telling us a little bit about each gun and the little stories he had with them. He would sit in his chair and he would draw out his gun and you know, there's a little picture of Duke on there and just being his old westerns and practicing on him. <sighs> Little things always mattered to him. My last memories with him. I got to see him a week or two before. Tenley was uh, wanting us to go outside and have a little picnic. Grandma had some lemonade, and we all went out there and set up a little table. I just sat there in lemonade and grabbed his Ford hat so he could be out in the sun. I like seeing Denley's love for him. Fabric, too. Always jumping on his lap. And Grandpa was always willing to give him a little hug and put a smile on their face. He also taught, told me a lot of stories. Right before I left, he told me a whole bunch of stories about the van. Took it different places, and Grandma always has a story of them 
back of the van getting caught by the cops. <laughs> uh, it's a special van and all of his vehicles are really special to all of us. Just all the little rides. I love you so much, Grandpa. We'll miss you. I'll try to keep all the vehicles running. Hopefully Bruce won't tear them up too much. We love you.
Uh, I'm grateful today to share some of the spiritual things that my father believed in. I'm grateful for his example and the sacrifices that he's made for me. Elder uh, Boyd K. Packer said in 1988, quote, mortal death came into the world at the fall. It is easier for me to understand that the word fall in the scriptures, if I think of it in two terms, location and condition. The word fall means to descend to a lower place. The fall of man was a move from the presence of God to mortal life on earth. That move down to a lower place came as a consequence to a broken law. Fall may also be des described as a change in condition. For instance, one can fall into a reputation or from prominence. The word fall well describes what transpired when Adam and Eve were driven from the Garden of Eden. A transformation took place in their bodies. The bodies of flesh and bone became temporal bodies. Uh, temporal means temporary, end of quote. In 2 Nephi, it reads, For as death hath passed upon all men to fulfill the merciful plan of the great creator, and the fall came by reason of transgression, and because man became fallen, they were cut off from the presence of the Lord. After death, uh, Alma spoke of this. He says, now concerning the state of the soul between death and the resurrection, behold, it has been made known unto me by an angel that the spirits of all men, as soon as they depart from this mortal body, yea, the spirits of all men, whether they be good or evil, are taken home to that God which gave them life. And then it shall, and then shall it come to pass that the spirits of those who are righteous are received into a state of happiness, which is called paradise, a state of rest, a state of peace, where they shall rest from all their troubles and from all care and sorrow. And I know that's where my father is now. Resurrection is a free gift given by the grace of God. There is nothing that we can do to earn this gift. Because Jesus Christ was resurrected, we all are given the gift of resurrection. Ordinances and co covenants are symbolic. The first ordinance of the gospel is baptism. We are, are immersed in water from a vertical position, returning to that same vertical position. This is symbolic of the death and resurrection we will each go through. Alma said, the soul shall be restored to the body and the body to the soul. Yea, every limb and joint shall be restored to its body. Yea, even a hair of the head shall not be lost, but all things shall be restored to their proper and perfect frame. Another free gift that we have been given because we are resurrected is the ability to live forever. Since we all get uh, these free gifts by the grace of God, uh, why should we keep the commandments or try to live a good life uh, where we build up other people, even ourselves, rather than tear others down or tear ourselves down? However, the, gr the greatest gift that God has is eternal life, which means that we live forever as families in God's presence. There is a difference between living forever and eternal life. Internal life requires effort on our part. It requires discipline uh, that is consistent with the laws and natures of God. By so doing, we maximize our freedom in the next life. We have been given commandments, the atonement, time, needed to discipline and cleanse our lives to prepare for this magnificent gift. I don't think we really understand the magnificence of eternal life. I know I really don't. Uh, but I know it has to be fantastic because I believe the words of the prophet and I know my dad did too. Uh, in Doctrine and Covenants it says, they shall inherit, it, it, regarding eternal life, shall inherit thrones, kingdoms, principalities, powers, dominions, all heights and depths. That is ultimate freedom. And that's, we see the effects of 
uh, people that, that try and rule kingdoms and thrones when they're not disciplined. And we see all the wars and confusion that happen in the world today, but as, as we're disciplined and we prepare ourselves, we have the ability to have eternal life uh, with Heavenly Father and have these thrones and principalities. In Doctrine and Covenants, it says, Seek not for riches, but for wisdom. And behold, the mysteries of God shall be unfolded unto you, and then shall you be made rich. Behold, he that hath eternal life is rich. And if you keep my commandments and do to the end, you shall have eternal life. Which, which gift is the greatest of all gifts of God? Uh, also, uh, Moses 139, For behold, this is my work and my glory to bring to pass immortality and eternal life of man. In order to be successful at keeping commandments, Heavenly Father knew that we would make mistakes and we would break his laws. So up front in his plan, he made another free gift possible, that of repentance. This comes because of the atonement of Jesus Christ. We apply this gift of repentance by doing two things. One, we need to correct the mistakes that we make. And the second is renewing the lease agreement with respect to repentance. So what do I mean by renewing the lease agreement with respect to repentance? In the business world, there's a concept of mergers and acquisitions. And this happens for large companies and they use it to maximize their profitability. Well, Heavenly Father uses this same technique with us. In our case, Christ is the parent company or the solvent partner. We are the ones being acquired with all our debts and liabilities. As you know, when one company takes over another, it takes over not just its assets, but it assumes all its debts and liabilities. Legal binding agreements are put in place during an acquisition. When the agreement terms are kept, the contract is binding. The contract or lease agreement for us is the ordinance of the sacrament. For most of us, that is the next ordinance that we need. When we partake of the sacrament each week, we renew our lease and it gives us more power through the promised guidance of the Holy Ghost to have greater capacity to repent, to love, to serve, to build up others, and even build up ourselves. For behold, the Lord your Redeemer suffered death in the flesh, before, wherefore he suffered the pain of all men, that all men might repent and come unto him. In Alma, he says, and he shall go forth suffering pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind. And this, that the word might be fulfilled, which he saith, he will take upon him the pains and the sicknesses of his people. And he will take upon him death, that he may loose the bands of death, which bind the people. And he will take upon him their infirmities, that his bowels may be filled with mercy according to the flesh that he may know according to the flesh how to succor his people according to their infirmities. I testify that life certainly continues after death. This is a mere preparation for a much greater life. Uh, I'd like to quote Elder Packer again. Uh, 1988, he said, Alma's, th Alma's son thought that death was unfair in his remarkable sermon on repentance, Alma taught his son about death, saying, Now behold, it is not expedient that man should be reclaimed from this temporal death, for that would destroy the great plan of happiness. Alma did not say that setting, setting mortal death aside would merely delay or disturb the plan of happiness. He said it would destroy it. The words of death and happiness are not close companions in mortality. But in the eternal sense, they are essential to one another. Death is a mechanism of rescue. Our first parents left guard Eden, lest they partake of the tree of life and live forever in their sins. The mortal death that they brought upon themselves and upon us 
is our journey home. End of quote. I'm grateful for Jesus Christ and his plan of happiness, and I know my father believed this with all his heart, and this I say in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, what a wonderful opportunity it has been to be here today to celebrate the life of a good man and to listen to the truths of eternity in the gospel of Jesus Christ. For 42 years of my life, I've had the opportunity of being the neighbor of Gay and Mary Ellen and their children. He wasn't a man of many words. I spent a lot of time in his home, around his corrals. Some of my earliest memories are docking sheep, catching lambs in his corral and taking them to him to dock. But how do you measure the character of a man? As I've sat here today, the thought has come to my mind that you can measure a man by the kind of husband and father that he was and the kind of neighbor that he was. What a touching moment it was to see many of his posterity stand and sing, families can be together forever. And I am sure, brothers and sisters, that he was looking down with pride and praying that each one of you will be with him again someday. It is obvious to see that he was a good husband and father. As I was planning to give my few remarks today, <clears throat> a memory sparked in my mind of something that I had read in my mother's journal and we ask what kind of a neighbor was Gay Van Dyke. In July of 1980, my father was killed and left my mother with several young sons to run the farm. I pulled out that journal this morning because something had been sparked in my memory. On July, July 19th of 1980, my mother wrote, woke up this morning to Gay hauling all of our hay he cut all of our hay, and he and Bishop Turner have hauled it all. That was the kind of neighbor Gay Van Dyke was. Numerous times our road was plowed when there was snow. I wasn't quite sure who it was, but I knew. That was the type of neighbor that Gay Van Dyke was. So though not a man of many words, I think we know the content of his character. And his character was good. Brothers and sisters, I testify that when we closed that casket in there a few minutes ago in our family prayer, that is not the last time that you will see your grandpa, your husband, and your father. He lives. And as Brother Rulin stated, Alma told us that he has gone home. I had a chance to be in his home a few weeks ago. One of my characters. And it was easy to see that he was ready to go home. And I testify that he is there. That he is at peace. He is resting from his sorrows. And he is smiling upon you, his posterity. Of this truth I bear in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We will now have our closing prayer by Sister Tanya Lewis, a daughter. Postlude music will be played by Lori Chapel, and we will move our services to the Lyman Cemetery. We will ask for the assistance of the pallbearers as we load the casket onto the truck, which, by the way, is the truck that his father owned and has been restored. The pallbearers today are Aaron Van Dyke, Van Dyke. Honorary pallbearers are all of the grandsons. We thank you for your attendance, and we'll love to see you at the cemetery. Tanya.
Heart of our kind Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to gather today, together today as family and friends. We're grateful for them. Life and, and his example where has he to be with us and give us peace in the times to come and that we may always remember him and his example and follow it. We are grateful for our Savior Jesus Christ and we're grateful for Gay and Grandpa and our father that he showed us Christ's example through his love, kindness, and service. We're grateful for our heritage and the gospel of Christ that we know that we can be together again. If we live worthy to be there. so grateful for what I've been given and we ask for thy blessings in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Okay, we'll uh, continue our services out here. We're going to have a musical selection from Reagan Greenwood, a granddaughter. And after that, we'll have a poem reading by Buddy Sellers, a grandson, and it's Our Spirit Lives On, and this poem was written by Mary Ellen. Um, after the poem, we'll have the grave dedication by Bruce Van Dyke, his son. And then uh, when that is done, we would invite all of you to come back to the church. We have a meal put together, put together by our Relief Society and Compassionate Services, so you're all welcome to come back and, and mingle, and thank you for your attendance. So we'll turn it over to Reagan. And Your Spirit Lives On by Mary Ellen Van Dyke. Love is eternal. Life is precious. And His Spirit lives on. Life is eternal. Love is precious. And His Spirit lives on. Christ's love is eternal. Your loved one is precious. And His Spirit lives on. The Holy Ghost comforts, blesses, and brings peace, and your spirit lives on. Our dear Heavenly Father, by the Melchizedek priesthood which I hold, I dedicate and consecrate the burial plot of the resting place for the body of Don Gay Van Dyke. I pray that the place will be hollowed and protected until the resurrection. And Heavenly Father, we pray for all the family members and everybody that they can find peace and be able to be comforted when they need it. Pray that everybody will be able to find the peace that they need and we pray that uh, everybody will be safe in their travels and I pray that you'll be able to tell grandpa that I'll take care of his property as much as I can we say this in Jesus Christ amen, amen.